Good afternoon, welcome. I'd like to start my talk with a quote from Goethe, who said, we don't know what we see, we see what we know. And now I'm gonna summarize my whole 18 minutes into this line, we see what we know. So if I were to put up this picture, all of you in this room can look at it, and you'd all say, oh, I see a beach, I see two kids, they're having fun. Well, when I look at this picture, as a radiologist, I know a little bit more, mainly because those are my two kids. So I know that one of the things we like to do on the beach is look for things. And we like to look for shells and sand dollars and starfish. And if you were to come with us, you'd know what they look like so you could help us find them, and we'd be able to all see it together. But I'm gonna turn this talk around and now talk about what we know about the big C. And the big C in this talk is cancer, and specifically, cancer in the head and neck. Now, Ruth referred to me as a radiologist, artist, pioneer, kind of my rap, I guess, so to speak. But I'm gonna to talk to you about our current reality, awareness, and progress that we're making with regards to head and neck cancer, and especially when that cancer decides to hitchhike or grow along those nerves toward your brain or your world. Now, I have a few disclosures. I have previously received funding from the Adenoid Cystic Carcinoma Foundation, a type of cancer that really likes to grow and track along your nerves. I'm also a consultant for Primal Pictures 3D Anatomy, and I'll be using those images throughout my talk. And most importantly, I really need to acknowledge the people here at TED and my colleagues at the hospitals I've worked at. To be honest, it's a, I'm just a small part of a huge team effort, and I really owe a gratitude of thanks to many of my colleagues for even allowing me to be here today. I will acknowledge Starbucks coffee. Um, I drink quite a bit of it. I also use it as what I call a hookup point for nerves where they like to meet and track along in the head and neck. Unfortunately, I have no financial relationship with Starbucks coffee as much as I would like to. So back in the 70s, when we think about hitchhikers, there was a great book that came out by Douglas Adam called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And he opens with these words, don't panic. And the great writer Arthur Clarke said these may be the best words and advice you can give to humanity. So the good news regarding head and neck cancer is that a lot of us have gotten the message. A lot less of us are smoking and drinking, and if we follow that red line, it has gone down. So cancers related to smoking and drinking are decreasing, and if you have one, the odds of you surviving have improved. Now the bad news. Because of this virus, which is popping up all over, the human papillomavirus, an orally and sexually transmitted virus, the incidences of cancer related to that virus are dramatically increasing. This black line is going way up. And work that was just done here at Ohio State University Medical Center by Moore Gillison, published last month, said it increased by 225% since 1988. That means all of us in this room are at risk and can be affected. And in fact, this work was published both in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal last month to make people aware of the epidemic that's about to come here. So you get a cancer. That cancer necessarily by itself won't kill you, but that cancer can grow along your nerves. And I want you to think about it for a second. It's a bit like science fiction, like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That tumor can transform itself and grow along your nerves and grow toward your brain. So what does that mean? Why is it important? It means if it's hitchhiking and growing along your nerves, it doubles the chance you're gonna have a tumor elsewhere in your body. The ability to control that tumor drops by over 50%. And the likelihood of that tumor when it hitchhikes on your nerve is going to come back, and that's what's going to kill you, are increased dramatically. So it's pretty important. I'd like to continue my talk with a tale of three patients regarding current reality, awareness, and progress that's going on with this. This first patient, like my husband and myself, was in their 40s and had two young kids. Went to a very established head and neck surgeon, felt a lump, took it out. The surgeon did a great job repaired that area, six months later comes back and says, I see a lot of pain on this side of my face. And the surgeon calls me up and says, Claudia, can you take a look inside, tell me what's going on? Now, when I heard this story, my heart sank because I knew that that tumor had already hitchhiked a long way up the nerve if the patient was already having symptoms. And all I could think about was, like any of us in this room, I've got two young kids. My husband has got two young kids. 
If we were taken out of the picture, what would go on? So we went back and looked at this patient's studies from the very beginning. And there's an expression in radiology that old films are the radiologist's best friend because they don't lie to you and they tell you the truth. And in the films six months prior to this patient coming in, it was there and it wasn't seen. Now this patient's come back six months later and that tumor is hitchhiking and growing into a portion of the brain called the cavernous sinus. And every day I think to myself, it was there six months earlier and we didn't see it and this patient subsequently died. So I went to the literature and said, how good are we at looking at this? And in fact, in our own literature, as doctors, people have written that it may be so common to miss this finding that it's considered the standard of care. And this really bothered me when I read this. So I said, all right, why don't we look in our own house, see how good we are, let's do a reality check in our own hospital. And we did, so we had to be honest about our own data. And we went back and looked, and the reality was in our own hospital, in retrospect, when we went back and looked, we were missing it 56% of the time. And yet I knew it was incredibly important to find it because I could find it before the patient had symptoms. So there was a disconnect. Something was going on here. We see what we know. So we needed to go back and really look on images where that tumor was and where the nerves were. We needed to go back and be aware of all those branches of the nerves and where they went to. And then we needed to go look and know those meeting places where those nerves could hook up, hitch up together, and hitch a ride on another nerve, what I call the Starbucks of the head and neck, and where those Starbucks are located. We needed to be aware of those routes, and we needed to know what those routes look like normally on imaging, and we needed to be aware of the functions of what nerves involve for taste, or moving a portion of your face, and if those were affected, where we needed to go look. So now we're aware, we're acutely sensitive, we've gotta be looking for this, and I have a 60-year-old patient who comes in and has a cancer right in front of his ear, and he can't move that side of his face. The biopsy shows it's a cancer, I know he can't move the side of his face, so we bring him in for imaging on a 1.5 Tesla MRI, standard imaging done, and it looks normal. So before I go to the next portion, I mentioned the word Tesla. So we talked at the very opening of this whole TED Talks was from the head of neuroscience about electricity. And we know about Edison, but not many of us know about Tesla. And Tesla was kind of a competitor and rival of Edison, responsible for a lot of the patents on electromagnetism and on the AC current. And he was a bit of an eccentric and people thought of a mad scientist. And interestingly, he died penniless in 1943. But in honor of all his work, in 1960, we name how strong the magnets are that we use in medicine after him. So sometimes you may look at something for a long time, but you have to turn it around and decide to look at it differently in order to see something that may be there. So we decided we would bring this patient back, even though we, everyone says it's normal, and try to look at it in a different way. And a lot of people said, it's never been seen, never been before it reported, you're crazy, it's, you're not gonna find it, you're, you know, what are you trying to do? And I said, you know what, we'll give it a shot. So we brought this patient back, and we knew that at 1.5, it was normal. We brought him back at three Tesla. And at three Tesla, I saw this image, and I was ecstatic. I could see this bright line tracking up through there, right where I knew that nerve was. I called up my surgeons, I said, there it is, I see it, it's right along the nerve. And they were very skeptical. They said, we'll see. Yeah, right, sure. So they took him to the OR. The patient underwent surgery, and I get a phone call. Now, when I get phone calls from my surgeons or my chairman, I tend to get very nervous. What did I do wrong? What did I miss? You know, I'm always thinking the worst. And the first words were, Claudia, we didn't see it with the naked eye. When we sent the sample to pathology, they did. And we spotted those hitchhikers tracking along that nerve. So we were ecstatic and we wanted to share this technique with other people so they could image carefully and use the same technique and it was published this last year on how to go about doing this to look for these tumors. We see what we know. The story is not over. I come, I get recruited over to Ohio State University Medical Center and the head of ENT contacts me a few months ago and says, I have a patient, we have a cancer on the side of his face and when he goes in the shower, 
the soap's getting in his eye, he can't blink it out. Something is wrong on that side of the face, but everyone has read his scans, and they say they're normal. Well, I say, send the scans over, I'll be glad to review them. So we look at them, and they look normal. But we tell the surgeons, bring him back, and bring him back with a three Tesla. And when we did, we could see those nerves along affecting that eye that were involved. So this patient, about a month ago, went to surgery, and it again confirmed in pathology where those hitchhikers were, where the tumor was hitchhiking on that nerve. So we've recently written up these and submitted these to be presented at our big meeting in the spring. We're waiting to hear about being accepted, and it's kind of like our Academy Award for Doctors, which is coming up this spring. So we've made some progress. We see what we know. But sometimes you have to take something you look at for a long time, turn it around, and try to look at it differently to see something that may have been there before. Now, I'd like to conclude my talk with the starfish story by Lauren Isley. And many of you may have heard this story, and if not, it bears repeating. And I realize I've only presented to you a few patients. But the stories of a scientist who goes out on a beach, and there's been a big storm the night before, so there's thousands of starfish washed up on the beach. And he sees a little girl, and she's picking up a starfish, throwing it in the water. And he comes up to her and he says, what, what the heck are you doing? And she says, the sun's coming up, the tide's going out, if I don't throw the starfish back in the water, it's gonna die. And he looks at her and he says, you're crazy, there's, there's thousands of starfish here along the beach, you're, you're not gonna make a difference. The little girl looks at him, picks up a starfish, throws it in the water, says, it made a difference to that one. And the scientist looks at her, bends down, picks up the starfish, and starts throwing it with her. So in conclusion, and at the end of my talk, I would like to aim, end and change that question to, what more could we see if we question what we know? Thank you.